Hello everybody, my name's Steve and welcome back to American Steam Legacy. Imagine being told that you are to participate in a constructive undertaking under the following circumstances. What is to be built is to be designed by committee, there is an insanely unrealistic deadline, there's a huge reliance on third parties to not only do their job right the first time but also deliver on their commitments, and the finished product has to meet expectations at a bare minimum. This sounds like a recipe for disaster, and it usually is. The old saying, if you want it bad, you'll get it bad, definitely applies here. For those of us that have worked as a project manager in an industrial setting or suffered through an SAP implementation, this fall probably sounds too familiar. However, the Baldwin Locomotive Works managed to pull off the impossible in the early summer of 1918 while working under the aforementioned circumstances. Not only did Baldwin meet the deadline by employees going above and beyond the call of duty, they managed to enhance employee morale during this effort rather than destroying it. This pretty well sums up the efforts to produce the first USRI standard locomotive, Light Mikado No. 4500 for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. As one would expect, every opportunity was taken to save time, but even the best of efforts sometimes resulted in the unexpected and the unforeseen, like a truck driver, the truck, and its cargo disappearing without a trace. So coming up next, the story of the USRA's firstborn, Baltimore and Ohio No. 4500, on American Steam Legacy. From 1918 to 1920, the USRA Mikado accounted for nearly one-third of all USRA standard locomotives built during that time period. 856 mites were delivered to the nation's railroads, with the light Mikado accounting for 625 of that number. So it seems only fitting that a light Mikado would be the first USRA standard to go into service. The specific light Mikado we're talking about here is the Baltimore, Ohio, number 4500. Fortunately, an unknown Baldwin employee authored an account of the superhuman effort that went into building number 4500 in record time. An in-house publication entitled, Got There and Got There in Time, detailed how the locomotive went from 100 days on the drawing board and 20 days in the shop to a complete locomotive ready for service. Besides the human effort that went into this feat, the industrial horsepower and logistics supporting it can't be overlooked. By 1918, Baldwin's manufacturing operations were spread out over two sites both of which would play key roles in meeting the July 4, 1918 deadline set by Baldwin Senior Vice President Samuel Vauclain. Baldwin's original plant was established in the 1830s in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. By 1918, the complex occupied over seven city blocks in the vicinity of Broad and Spring Garden Streets. By the turn of the 20th century, Baldwin had all but outgrown the Philadelphia site and was forced to look elsewhere for more space. In 1906, Baldwin purchased 660 acres along the Delaware River, less than 10 miles south of Philadelphia, in Eddystone, Pennsylvania. By 1912, there was manufacturing activity at both sites, with all manufacturing and Baldwin's corporate headquarters being moved to the Eddystone site by the late 1920s. Baldwin's Philadelphia plant would be demolished by the mid-1930s. On March 1, 1918, Baldwin received word from the USRA to begin preparing drawings for three locomotives, the Mikado, the Pacific, and the mountain type, with heavy and light versions of each. Since Baldwin was using the Pennsylvania Railroad's L1S class as the basis for the light Mikado, and the road's K4 class for the heavy Pacifics, this somewhat streamlined the work that followed. Baldwin had built the L1s and the K4s for the Pennsylvania Railroad, so they at least had some of the drawings they needed for the USRA standards. As for the mountain types, we'll get into those in another video. Baldwin's chief mechanical engineer, Kenneth Rushton, apparently shifted the engineering and drafting departments into overdrive because they completed this task by March 16th. But the hard work was only beginning. Subcommittees representing the Builders Committee and the Railroad Committee were present to review each drawing as it was completed. The various members of each committee with their various preferences, points of view, and opinions resulted in a seemingly never-ending stream of revisions. As if things weren't hectic enough, on April 14, 1918, ALCO Chief Engineer Joe Ennis thought it would be a good idea to begin work on the USRA's heavy and light switchers, Santa Fe's, and mallets. In all fairness to Mr. Ennis, he was probably acting under a directive received from the higher-ups of the USRA, so let's not shoot the messenger. 
The exact number of Baldwin engineers and draftsmen involved in this effort is unknown, but it is safe to say that it was an all-hands-on-deck effort. By early May, the changes were still coming in left, right, and center. Even though the prints and specifications for the boiler weren't yet ready, the boiler shop at the Eddystone plant ordered and received all the material required to build one boiler by the end of May. Because of the committee's nonstop revisions, work wasn't able to begin until June 13, 1918. Production at the Philadelphia plant was equally hamstrung by the committee's dwaddling. The Philadelphia plant was to produce the locomotive's frames and cylinders, but the committee members believed the frames weren't heavy enough and the design had to be altered. The time crunch was also being felt by Baldwin's suppliers as well, and while most were able to rise to the occasion, there was one notable exception. Buckeye Steel Castings was to produce the tender truck side bolsters, but wasn't able to turn around Baldwin's order in the time required. Buckeye, presumably backlogged by other orders, stated it couldn't begin work until mid-July and would require four weeks to make the patterns and produce the castings. They gave Baldwin an expected delivery date of August 12, 1918, five weeks after the July 4th deadline set by Volklain. Fortunately, a local steel company came to the rescue. The Penn Steel Corporation, located in nearby Chester, Pennsylvania, got into the spirit of things. Baldwin made the patterns in-house and delivered them to Penn Steel on June 16th. By June 20th, all four side bolsters had been cast and delivered to Baldwin's Philadelphia plant, where the tender was being built in the 17th Street Tender Shop. Commonwealth Steel of St. Louis, Missouri was another hero, turning out the cast steel tender frame in record time. Even though the Philadelphia plant was also turning out a myriad of smaller detail parts, Baldwin's reliance on other manufacturers wasn't limited to Buckeye, Commonwealth, or Penn Steel. The means of transporting items produced by others also varied. There are accounts of small parts being picked up and brought to the plant by Baldwin employees as baggage. Cardboard boxes, small wooden crates, and even an 1870s-era carpet bag were used. In one instance, a Pullman car designed for transporting racehorses was used to ship the locomotive's rear frame cradle from St. Louis to Eddystone since it was the only car available. In fact, most would assume railroads would have handled all the freight being shipped to Baldwin. But the rush to complete number 4500 provided a glimpse into the future. Baldwin not only relied on express trucking companies, but also pressed their own fleet of cargo trucks into service. Parts from as far away as St. Louis and Chicago were brought in on trucks. This was at a time when the interstate highway system as we know it didn't exist and long-haul trucking really wasn't a thing. This is to say nothing of the roads over which these vehicles had to travel. A young army officer and future president, Dwight Eisenhower, participated in a coast-to-coast -coast convoy around this time period. The trip left such an impression on him that when he became president of the United States 32 years later, he signed into law a bill that appropriated funds to build our modern highways, since he saw them critical to national security. The largest shipment by truck was the boiler dry pipe. At 15 feet long and 9 inches in diameter, it's fortunate that this particular component was coming from nearby Reading, Pennsylvania. Baldwin's own trucks brought in the injectors, lubricators, and boiler check valves from Nathan Manufacturing in Brooklyn, New York. The only shipment that was lost came from U.S. Steel's Homestead Works in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The steel piston heads were to be delivered to the Eddystone plant, but the truck driver, the truck, and the cargo were never seen or heard from again. With parts streaming in from all quarters and the manufacturing in full swing, it soon came time to begin the assembly process. On June 19, 1918, track number 8 in Erecting Bay 1 at the Eddystone plant was made ready. The engine frame and cylinders were set in place, and three days later, the boiler was lowered into possession. On June 27th, the boiler was pressure tested, and number 4500 was put on wheels for the first time. The driver, pilot, and trailing trucks were installed along with the running gear. June 29th saw the superheater installed, boiler pressure safety valve set, and the boiler jacket applied. The cylinders were also blown down in preparation for being placed under steam. On July 2nd, number 4500 was fired up and taken for a test ride around the Eddystone plant. The following day, the final touches were applied. The road number 4500 was painted on the cab and the tender was lettered for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The remainder of the day was consumed with taking builders' photographs and inspections by Baldwin executives. Finally, on July 4th, 1918, number 4500 was declared complete and ready for delivery, and it was all done in record time. Number 4500 would be the first USRA locomotive completed and the first of 100 USRA light Mikados delivered to the Baltimore and Ohio. Baldwin's claim of 100 days on the drawing board and 20 days in the shop wasn't too far off the mark. The actual numbers are 110 days on the drawing board and 15 days in the shop. Either way, this was a remarkable accomplishment. What's equally impressive is number 4500 would go on to serve the Baltimore and Ohio for the next 39 years. In 1957, number 4500 was pulled from service and given the road number 300.
In the late 1950s, local business owner Ed Striegel of the Striegel Supply and Equipment Corporation in Curtis Bay, Maryland, purchased number 4500 from the B&O, along with another historically significant locomotive, Baltimore, Ohio, number 5300. He donated both locomotives to the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad Museum in Baltimore, Maryland in 1964. Number 4500, or perhaps we should say 300, is on display at the museum to this day. In 1990, the locomotive was designated a National Historic Mechanical Engineering Landmark by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. And once again, my name's Steve, and thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.